Well, good morning, everybody. On behalf of the University of Helsinki, I'd like to welcome you to the first online Helsinki Think Talk for the United Kingdom, titled Inspired by Finland, the Future of Education. My name is Adam Pratchett. I'm a liaison manager at the University of Helsinki, and I'll be moderating today's event. This event is designed to be an introduction to the Finnish education system and the work the University of Helsinki is doing in this field. It's also an opportunity for you to hear from some of Finland's top education officials, researchers and teachers, and to ask them your questions. With this in mind, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for their participation in today's event. Minister of Education, Jussi Saramo, the Rector of the University of Helsinki, Sari Lindblom, Professor Minna Hortelainen, and Vice Principal Jana Silvanoinen. As a university, we're strategically focused on global engagement, and this event is the first of many events we'll be organizing related to the future of education in the UK, but also our other global themes around climate change, the future of health, and making artificial intelligence smarter and more ethical. We were blown away by the interest in the event today, and we're delighted to be joined by so many influential individuals and organizations from across the UK education sector. So thank you for your participation. We look forward to hearing your questions. Both the UK and Finland are seen as leaders in education, but perhaps in different ways or for different reasons. We know there is so much we can learn if partners in Finland and the UK share their expertise and collaborate together. Therefore, from this event, we hope to be able to start discussions and longer term engagement with key stakeholders in the UK education sector and identify the ways we can support each other as we all strive to create the future of education. I must also say that we very much understand uh, the UK effectively has four different education systems in England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And looking at the list of people who registered for today's events, we are fortunate to have representation from almost all corners of the UK. Just a small note to say that this event is being recorded and the recording with subtitles will be available after the event and shared with you. I must also sincerely apologize as unfortunately live closed captions will not be available for this meeting. Accessibility is really important for us as a university. However, unfortunately, we weren't able to secure live closed captions for this event, but this will be in place for our future international events. Just to go over the general plan for today's events, each speaker will be delivering their speech or presentation, and then there'll be an opportunity for you to ask your questions. If there's time at the end, We'll also bring together two of our speakers, Minna Hortelainen and Jana Silvanoinen, for a mini panel discussion to answer any questions you may have. We really want today to be an interactive event and for you to be able to ask your questions and share your experience. As the event has been so popular uh, and to make sure we can answer as many questions as possible, we have decided that I as the moderator will read out the questions submitted rather than allowing people to speak to ask their question personally. Therefore, if you have a question, please write it in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. There are lots of people attending today's event, so we'll do our best to answer your questions. But if we don't have a chance, and there's something you'd really like to know, uh, please send me an email. Uh, one of my colleagues, I'm sure, will put it in the chat for you. Also, if you'd like to share your thoughts about today's event on social media, please make sure to tag the University of Helsinki and use the hashtag HelsinkiEdu, which is on the screen, and hashtag Inspired by Finland. We'll also be live tweeting the event today, so make sure to uh, tag our Twitter profile at Helsinki Uni. So without further ado, to deliver today's opening speech and to take a couple of questions from the audience, I'm delighted to be joined by the Finnish Minister of Education, Jussi Saramo. Jussi is a long-standing political figure who has held a number of elected local city and national positions before being appointed as Minister of Education in December, 2020. Thank you so much for joining us, Minister Saramo. The floor is yours. Thank you, <clears throat> distinguished participants, dear friends. I'm happy to address that this first Think Talk event by the University of Helsinki with a focus on the future of education. I hope you will find the experiences of Finland inspiring and remain interested in partnering with us. I wish to share with you some key experiences from Finland. Firstly, as a small nation, Finland has chosen to invest in equality since we simply cannot afford to leave anyone behind in society. Countries can only be as strong as their human capital. 
harnessing the potential of every individual is not only morally correct, but also the smartest policy for well being and prosperity in society. Finland has been ranked many times by the UN as the world's happiest nation. Secondly, according to our experience, investing in education and the entire knowledge chain from early childhood to higher education, science and innovation can transform a nation from a poor and rural society into a thriving economy. Within roughly 100 years of independence, Finland has developed from one of the poorest to become one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Finally, for us, equity, inclusion and quality in education go hand in hand. And this requires long-term commitment by the entire society. We pride ourselves on an educational system that offers equal opportunities for all. This is a fundamental value for us. Children can attend schools anywhere in Finland and still receive the same high quality education. We are constantly striving to improve educational quality and equality. For example, we aim to increase participation in early childhood education and care. As a key measure to prevent marginalization, we have made a historic reform to raise the compulsory school leaving age to 18 years. In all measures, our focus is on support, well being, and guidance of learners. To that, we hope that half of our young adults would have a higher education degree by 2030. Dear friends, in Finland, education is developed in a broad collaboration with stakeholders based on science and evidence. Higher education institutions, such as the University of Helsinki, play a central role and with their support, we are also able to explore innovative approaches and new technologies. We believe in high quality teacher education as one of the cornerstones of our educational system. Teachers are required to have master's degrees. Teaching uh, profession is an attractive career choice in Finland and universities are able to select the most talented and more motivated applicants. Teachers have a lot of professional autonomy and they know how to put an individual learner to the center. University-led teacher education combines research and teaching practice and provides the basis for continuous professional development. In the rapidly changing world, it is important that teachers update their skills throughout their career. Dear friends, uh, we do not have inspectorate system in Finland, nor do we have school rankings. The focus in Finnish education system is on learning rather than testing. We trust in our teachers and education providers. There are no national standard side tests for pupils in basic education. Rather than being prepared for tests, we want to empower children to become problem solvers, critical thinkers and positive change makers in society. This is supported by transversal competencies such as digital competencies, media literacy, communication skills and sustainable future, which are rooted in our national core curricula in an interdisciplinary manner at all levels of education. Our system is also flexible with no dead ends, as we want to ensure everyone to, uh, the opportunity to always continue studies. Everyone should be prepared to learn new things throughout life. This is why we put a lot of emphasis on continuous learning, which starts already in early childhood education and care. Our system emphasizes how to learn rather than what to learn. Dear uh, partic participants, in a year much has changed in our lives. The disruption has challenged us all. It has become evident that education systems with flexibility and ability to offer hybrid solutions, which can be adjusted to better suit local and individual needs are prone to be more resilient as they are more responsive. In case of Finland, I dare to say that overall the education providers have coped well. 
highly qualified teachers and the diversity of learning environments, also digital, which were used already before the pandemic, as well as an education system built on inclusion and support have to contribute it to this. For us, quality education has become an issue of resilience. Never before has it been an important to see education as an investment in the future. It is our vaccine to build back better and greener. Dear friends, I wish to conclude by emphasizing that it is only through partnership in education and research that we can find innovative solutions for the increasingly complex and urgent problems facing humanity. Therefore, I warmly invite you to consider Finland and the University of Helsinki as your partner in studies, research and work. The University of Helsinki continues to play a very central role in pioneering the future of learning. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister Sarimo, for your speech. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience I'd like to put to you. Uh, the first question is from Lord McConnell, the former First Minister of Scotland. And his question is, one of the major challenges around the world is the gap in education outcomes between school students from disadvantaged backgrounds and students who have a very secure and supportive home environment. Does Finland also have this challenge? And if so, uh, has Finland taken any measures which have significantly closed this gap between students? Thank you, uh, Your Excellency. Thank you for this important question. Uh, indeed, we uh, recognize the significance of home background of learning also in Finland. Although the regional differences remain low, we do see a trend where the socioeconomic background of parents has an increasing impact of learning outcomes. This is one of our ma uh, main worries now. Also, the differences in performance of girls and boys are quite big. Our girls outperform boys. Human capital inherited from home also has a more effect on boys than girls. Basically, our system is designed to foster equity. Through early in intervention, we aim at providing special support as soon as the need arises. People and student welfare services are provided uh, through uh, multi-professional collaboration. Uh, which mean like uh, school healthcare, psychologists, social workers, and so on. To add, the dialogue between home and school is continuous. We emphasize a lot uh, the joy of learning. This requires well being and understanding schools as uh, learning communities where both learners and teachers play an active role. All schools are required to prepare plans for equality and non discrimination. However, these unwanted trends encourage us to strengthen our emphasis on equi equity and equality at all levels of education even further. And now we will alloc allocate uh, 180 million euros for improving quality and equality in uh, basic education through a right to learn program between 2020 and 2022. And we also have a special government grant to promote equality for education providers that have a more challenging operational environment. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, it has been evident that some children receive more support from home than others. And some have, uh, may have their personal space, more space at home dedicated for learning, while others may need to share a room and equipment with siblings or a lot of other family members. And in terms of COVID-19 response, we have made substantial additional investments in support for learning and well-being at all levels of education. And the well-being package of the government were uh, worth 320 million euros, covers additional support for municipalities and education providers in arranging in the necessary support measures. And, and the um, decision on additional locations was made early on last summer in order to ensure that uh, schools were equipped with support measures from the very beginning of the semester. But we still see there are huge differences between families, but also between teachers and between schools. And these gaps we are trying to make small as possible. 
Thank you. And one final question for you. I know you have a very busy schedule. Um, the past year has obviously been very challenging for educators across the world, but we've also seen lots of innovation. Uh, what do you think is the, the biggest lesson that the Finnish education system has learned during the pandemic? I think the biggest uh, lesson, uh, lesson for us has been uh, that even Finland is very proud of being uh, one of the one of the countries that is very uh, digitalized and very uh, we were very well known for our uh, uh, knowledge in, in high tech at least in the Nokia times but we still are working a lot of in this we see that school is not just for learning but it's a it's a very important uh, place for children and and it's very important for them to meet their uh, other other children and and, and at least the young people we have had in the uh, in the high school and in in uh, the older students who have been more in distance learning have had huge mental problems and, and problems of coping not just the learning process but but uh, they really need the their uh, the, their friends and and they they miss their teachers we have seen that uh, one thing that young people have learned that they really love or like their schools because in normal times we see that school is something that is often disliked and, and this has been changing a lot and, and, and I think that it has learned us that even in future we have more, uh, we have learned how to use our uh, digital uh, environment better but we also uh, respect more our old ways of learning. And I think uh, we have to find ways to connect these two better in future, because now we still have had not enough time uh, to teach all the teachers, to uh, use all the new environments and, and, and to, we still have a lot to work. And after, this pandemic, we hope that there will be no new pandemics, but we have to uh, also to take to uh, to uh, learn uh, to all these different kinds of uh, problems in society that our uh, education is always prepared for everything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Saramo. That's unfortunately all the time we have for questions, but I want to thank you once again for your participation. And we very much appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. All the best for everyone. Thank you. The next speaker uh, in today's event is the Rector of the University of Helsinki and Professor of Higher Education and Educational Psychology, Sari Limblom. Uh, as a professor, Sari's areas of research include students' approaches to learning in higher education, individual study paths, and the effects of well-being on study success. Sari, over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adam. Uh, dear guests, um, it is a great pleasure to be able to talk to you this morning about the role of the University of Helsinki in developing Finland's education system and the future of learning. For those who aren't aware, the University of Helsinki is Finland's oldest university, founded in 1640 by your 13 year old girl, Queen Christina of Sweden. To this day, we retain the childlike wonder that anything is possible and with multidisciplinary research and international collaboration, we can discover new knowledge and find solutions that will have an impact on generations across the world. As a university, we are ranked in the top 0.5% of the world's research universities, and we have 40,000 students and researchers working across 11 faculties. Whilst as rector, I am very proud of all, our, all of our research and work, but one of our most famous strengths internationally is our work in education research and practice. At the University of Helsinki, we have played a central role in developing Finland's internationally coveted education system. We have worked in close collaboration with Finnish governments by sharing our expertise and latest research discoveries to help inform policy decisions. This has helped us to quickly adapt to the times and anticipate the future needs of society. 
I believe our education system in Finland is successful because we have created a strong link between research, practice and policy from preschool all the way to higher education. I therefore always emphasize to colleagues around the world that the development of the quality of teaching and learning needs to be based on discipline specific empirical evidence and that this evidence needs to inform strategic decisions concerning education policy. In Finland, our teachers are trained to the highest level using the latest scientific research and practice. At the University of Helsinki, our researchers are fearless pioneers as they work across disciplines to conduct scientific research and develop new teaching methods in real life settings. As a result, we are able to immediately test the latest research ideas and teaching methods in the classroom, collect data and make discoveries quickly and effectively. As the Minister of Education, Jussi Sarasmo already mentioned, Saramo already mentioned, in Finland we strongly believe in the principle of equality and the right to education. That is why university education is tuition free for Finnish and EU citizens, and children and adolescents can receive the same high quality education wherever they live. That being said, we know Finland's system is far from perfect and there are many areas we still need to improve. Whilst Finland is considered as one of the most equal societies in the world, we still have persistent challenges and we know equality of opportunity does not mean equality of outcome. As a university, we want to tackle these inequalities head on and we have pioneering research groups investigating everything from the impact of urban geography on education outcomes, diversity, multilingualism and social justice in education and tackling radicalization and isolation in our digital world. Through international cooperation and exchanging ideas, like in today's event, we hope to learn from others and work together to create a more equal world and better education system for all. As a psychologist and professor of higher education, my own research includes impact of well-being and stress on study success in university students. As we all know, COVID-19 has completely changed the education landscape and not only put pressure on education systems and teachers, but also students. From our research, we know that a student, student's feeling of well-being and self-efficacy are essential prerequisites for high, for high quality learning. Research shows that students who have skills to study independently have hugely enjoyed the freedom of online learning and have been able to maintain or even improve their results. However, students who are not used to independent forms of learning or have challenges in their personal life have found remote learning stressful and their results have suffered. This polarization is worrying and especially as we look towards creating the future of learning, this is something which all of us should take into consideration and aim to address. We must learn from our experiences during the pandemic taking the best remote learning innovations and combining them with new face-to-face -face practices. Disciplinary expertise is not enough anymore. Each student must be proficient in the core skills of the new millennium. Socio-emotional skills needed by all include curiosity, social skills, the will to cooperate and grit as well as resilience. As educators, we must support students and give them tools to maintain sustainable well-being. In conclusion, we strongly believe that by educating new experts in learning and through research collaboration, we can promote equality on a global scale. Post-COVID-19, I hope to be able to welcome you, many of you in person to the University of Helsinki to see how Finland's education system works. Through sharing knowledge openly and international cooperation, we can build a better and a more sustainable world. Together, with your help, we can create the future of learning 
and education. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sonny. I will now take some questions from the Q&A box. Um, first of all, both yourself and the minister mentioned in your speeches the importance of students' welfare or well-being, and so, and also how students have responded differently to the pandemic. Uh, with this in mind, how does the University of Helsinki uh, support its students and also monitor their welfare? This is a, thank you very much for this important question. Of course, we had done a lot before the pandemic already and, and uh, developed many, many different tools to, to help students. We have, for, for example, developed ourselves uh, a tool which is called Digital Tutor for, for our university students, with this, with this, which is a questionnaire which students ask many times during their academic studies and they get immediate feedback. And we also monitor in this questionnaire uh, their, their levels of stress, uh, their well-being, and, and experiences of the workload. And also we were able to add questions related to experiences in, in, in the online learning environments uh, from the beginning of uh, last March. So this is one, one way. And then of course in, in Finland, we have study psychologists, licensed psychologists like I am working inside universities to help students. And these, these uh, psychologists we have had for uh, more than 15 years. So uh, a lot have, have been done, but what has been done during the last year is to develop more digital low threshold support services for, for the students. And this is something we constantly work and also to, to um, invite uh, more students to participate in, in our services. Thank you. And the next question is, um, in the past year, uh, COVID-19 has changed the way that we teach and learn across all levels of education. In Finland, do you think universities were prepared for the move to online learning? And what were some of the lessons that you've perhaps learned from the pandemic? I think in Finland, and as Minister Saramo already referred to this, that we, we have been technically developed also in, 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 in our education systems. And I think we were quite well prepared for, for this situation in that our students, as well as teachers, had very good digital skills. But of course, uh, this uh, change has been huge. And uh, a lot of things have, have to be uh, developed uh, uh, during the last year in order to cope with the new situation. But I, I think we were well enough prepared, but none of us, of course, expected, expected, uh, expected that this would last for such a long time and we would still be in, in this situation um, heavily uh, kind of um, weighing on well-being and stress. So um, quite well, but uh, there is a lot to, still to be done. Of course. And the, the final question has uh, come in is, as the rector of the University of Helsinki, what do you think the future of higher education will look like? Will we return to 100% face-to-face teaching and learning, or is kind of remote learning here to stay? I think it's a kind of hybrid, a combination of old and new. We, we, we can never go back and we can never become a digital university. So I, as, I, as I mentioned in my short, uh, short presentation, we really, and we have already actually started to think about this uh, a year ago. How, what does our university look like when, when this is over? And I think it's, it's about picking the best practices from, from the elements we miss from face-to-face -face learning and make them innovative in a way that they are not old but they are new and then maintain the good practices a kind of freedom to study uh, freedom to take courses uh, in, in in different forms and this will be a combination and i'm sure that the combination or the hybrid looks different in different faculties and different disciplines because we need to tailor the new practices old and new in, into a way that it, it um, responds to the disciplinary um, um, differences. Thank you so much, Sorry, That's unfortunately all we have time for with you today, but thank you for your participation in today's event. Very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker uh, in today's event uh, is Professor Minna Hortelangen. Uh, Minna is a multi-award winning professor of cognitive science and director of the university's Changing Education International Masters Programme. Minna, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'm very excited to, to speak to you about the need of the multidisciplinary approach for, for educational sciences. And I want to share a few slides with you just to show what I mean. Uh, why do we need a multidisciplinary approach uh, in education? There are several reasons for that, of course. And the first reason is something that, uh, that uh, Jussi Saramo already mentioned in his talk is that uh, we have so many different types of learners and we want all of our learners to to be welcomed by the educational system starting from the very young ones all the way to old age we want to offer education to to everybody and also of course the content of education what are we actually teaching this varies a lot and this requires collaboration between the different fields of science uh, also, we know that we have very different types of learners and one of my favorite quotes is that nobody is an average learner. We don't have anybody uh, who would actually be average in every, uh, every type and detail of learning. And here, of course, neuroscience and educational psychology can offer us understanding about how uh, attention systems work and so on. And how should we deal with uh, students who have or pupils who have very specific learning problems, like, for example, dyslexia or who just otherwise are very special, like people on the autism spectrum. And to keep this in mind, I think that this collaboration between neuroscience and education and educational psychology and, and educational science is very, very important. Uh, also, um, we need to understand the society and we need to understand the background from which our learners are coming from. This was already also discussed in Minister Saramos' uh, talk. We know that some of our learners are very heavily supported by their families. They have a lot of support uh, in, in their homework, for example, and also those situations from which they, they enter school or the university. While we know that there are other students who are struggling uh, at their families, they may have severe problems in the families, and it might actually be the students who is who are the support persons for their own families. So the situation from the background is, is could be very different. And here we need uh, understanding of how the society works and what we can do about it uh, practically. So I'm the head of the Changing Education Master's program. This is an English language uh, two year program. For, for bachelor students to enter and they, they spend two years with us learning about how to change education and how education can be used as a change making agent in the world. Uh, this program is very multidisciplinary in nature, so it consists of, of two major fields of, of uh, uh, studies, equity, diversities, uh, global uh, impact. Uh, uh, these types of questions are studied from the point of view of sociology, political science and so on. And they are, of course, meant for the students to understand how the educational systems in the world are operating and how, what is their impact and how to take into account also the, the global situation. Uh, then another very kind of uh, contrasting view for education is the view from neuroscience and educational psychology, which is um, very much based on motivation, community, students with special needs and so on. And I must say that I personally very much like this contrast that is brought uh, to the field between these, these two very extreme views of, of educational sciences. Then we have a third very practical uh, part of the studies related to didactics, uh, getting to know the Finnish educational system, discussing educational leadership and so on, visiting Finnish uh, schools and, and educational institutions. Quite a lot of that visit is, is remotely at the moment, but we are hoping for better times to come to be able to also to take our students to the actual schools and, and daycare centers and, and so on. So how is this program going to change education? Well, of course, it is via our students. Our students uh, will produce research results that will change the way that we are thinking 
our students will also learn to be critical. I have to say that even at the entrance, when they come to our program, they seem to have this, this ability to ask the question why, which is, of course, always the most important question. When they learn to do research themselves, because the program is very research based, they will know how to follow the latest results in their field and their knowledge will stay up to date even uh, for a long time after they have left us they will still be interested in, in following the latest research in their own field and of course they are networking with people from many different nationalities who are going to be in important positions in education in their own countries or in global positions and this network of course will make them also uh, possibility to make a global impact. So I really highly believe in our students. This is the final picture I want to show you. This is a photo taken by me from a Finnish school when we were recording brain activity from second graders. Uh, they had a drawing and writing task going on. And as you can see, some of the pupils are very much focused uh, on their task and heavily working on the task. Some of them have something important to say to the teacher. Some of them are slightly distracted by some noise in the back of the room. And some of them are already feeling quite bored with their task. So this diversity within the same task, I think it's a very, very good starting point for understanding why we actually need all of these multidisciplinary approaches to educate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minna. Uh, we have a couple of really interesting questions uh, about creativity in, in the Finnish education system. And so the question is, how important is the development and enhancement of creativity in the Finnish education system? And how is this incorporated practically? And how does that impact on learning outcomes? Oh, that's a very, very good question and important one. We have a long tradition of having artistic subjects in the Finnish curriculum. So, for example, music and visual arts have been in the curriculum for a very long time. Also, more practical subjects like uh, crafts and home economics. Uh, I think Finland is quite famous for, for these subjects and, and th there are several reasons why those subjects are there. Of course, the content knowledge in these areas is important, but it's not only that, it's also a way to teach. Uh, a way to teach the pupils and the students to, to actually grow their creativity and grow also their practical skills. And one important reason for these school subjects is also to combine them with other subjects. So if you think about, for example, history, how could you think about history without music and national anthems and so on? There are many, many ways to combine uh, arts with mathematics and so on. And there are many uh, things and, and quite in interesting trials that teachers are, are doing uh, this type of using the artistic uh, methods as a teaching methods. And I think that is also one, one answer to this question. Um, I think that when we talk about modern skills, so in that sense, uh, creativity and artistic endeavor become even more important. It's not only content knowledge that is enough, but it's also that you have to be able to create amongst those things and also to be able to present your ideas in a, in a way that then takes also people on board. Thank you. I have a couple more questions which I'm going to combine together. Uh, so they're about your Changing Education Master's program. And the question is, uh, just to be clear, is the degree a teacher qualification program? And also we had some questions about scholarships at the university and asking, are there scholarships available to study uh, your Changing Education Master's program? Okay, thank you. The, these are really clarifying questions. It is not a teacher qualification degree. Many of our students actually have teacher qualification from their own country that is embedded in the bachelor's degree, but not all of them at all. So what we are trying to make here is, is to have educational professionals who have all the tools that are required to, to make them be able to change the world of education and also be part of creating the future of education. Uh, something that I want, also want to emphasize is the diversity of the different uh, students coming from many, many countries, 27 nationalities in total. So that's quite a lot of uh, diversity in the class. So this also uh, helps people get a different perspective from their own, own home countries and, and those educational systems. 
uh, that was the good news. And then I have to say, say the bad news about the, the tuition fees. So uh, it is uh, tuition free, free. The tuition is free for people from uh, Finland and, and European and ETA uh, area citizens. But for others, there is a tuition fee. We have some scholarships, but in my opinion, we have way too little scholarships. We would definitely need more of those because they are very competitive and they are only for the very best students. But we are trying to increase the number of the scholarships. Thank you. And the next question uh, is, uh, Minna, you know, your research background includes kind of neuroscience and how the brain works. And during these kind of remote learning times, what are some of the most important things to think about regarding the brain to make sure we kind of optimize learning, even if it's remote? Oh, well, some very basic things, of course, come to my mind. If you think about going to school in the morning, walking through through this wonderful uh, na nature and so on, and then meeting your friends in the schoolyard and so on, you miss all of that in the remote learning. So you have to actually compensate that somehow. Maybe then you have to take your dog for a longer walk or do something like that, because we really need those encounters and we need to use our bodies, not only sit beside the computer, but actually do something with our bodies and also uh, be way, find ways to get excited about the learning content and this i would say happens in discussions between the, the pupils that's great thank you and another question we have uh is about um how you and other researchers how do you uh share or uh, your research with teachers to help improve uh their kind of how they practically teach in their methods well, that's a very important thing. And I think that uh, educational research is, is worthless if we don't share it with the teachers. We have a network of very excited teachers who are always following our research and we, we send them emails and we give them a lot of information about this. But that's not enough because we have to reach all the teachers. And this is via the con. I think uh, Minna's internet has uh, crashed, so hopefully she'll be able to uh, quickly rejoin us. So apologies for that. We'll wait a minute to hopefully get her to rejoin. OK, if not, what we'll do is we'll move on to the next speaker uh, and we can always come back to Minna afterwards. Um, so the, the final speaker for today's event is Jana Silvanoinen. Uh, Jana is Vice Principal of Helsinki Normal Lyceum School, which is one of two schools as part of the University of Helsinki and is used for teacher uh, education and research. So Jana, the floor is yours. Thank you for taking part in today's event. Over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, dear fellow educational professionals, uh, just like Adam said, my name is Jana Silvenoinen. I'm the vice principal of Helsinki Normal Lyceum, which is one of the two teacher training schools at the University of Helsinki. I have been working as a teacher, teacher educator and vice principal for a long time and have actively been reflecting on our school system in an international context, especially within the past few years. Today, I wanted to give you an insight into Finland's education system from a teacher's perspective. I believe that the key factors in the development of our school system are our history, values as a nation and teacher education. Less than 100 years ago, Finland was a very poor country with a low standard of education. Due to the lack of natural resources, education was seen as a way to rise socially out of poverty, and it worked. As a result, education and the teacher profession, teaching profession became highly respected and valued in society. As Finland's wealth increased, we believed it was important to make sure everyone benefited and we rose up together. This applied to education too. Therefore, there was and still is a strong belief in equality and everyone's right to education, regardless of one's socioeconomic background. In addition, we developed a strong special education system to help ensure that no one is left behind. About one third of all our primary and lower secondary school pupils use special education at some point during their studies. Thus, the strong belief in equality and equity is implemented in the daily work of, the, of any Finnish school in a very visible and practical way. Trust is also an important value in the Finnish school system. In Finland, teachers enjoy significant trust, not only from parents, 
but also from political decision makers. Our education system benefits from long-term planning, which enables schools and teachers plan their work in a sensible way. Before passing new laws, politicians rely on educational professionals, which creates a welcome collaboration and unity between various groups of people. The Finnish teacher is also significantly autonomous compared to teachers in other countries. This, I truly believe, results from quality teacher training. Teacher education in Finland is rigorous, strongly research-based and completely university-led. As part of their studies, student teachers practice teaching at one of our university teacher training schools. These are normal schools with full-time pupils and teachers. Mentoring student teachers is a vital part of these teachers' work. At Helsinki Normal Lyceum, for example, we have 650 pupils aged 7 to 8 and 13 to 19, 70 teachers and about 170 student teachers every year. University teacher training schools are essential as they bridge the gap between theory and practice and ensure each student teacher is effectively supported. Furthermore, by having so many student teachers together at the same school, student teachers are able to collaborate and learn from each other's experiences as they all progress towards becoming qualified. One of the main focuses in Finnish teacher training is creating lesson plans. Student teachers are guided to find their own teacherhood and encouraged to search for new innovative ways to deliver, in, to deliver their lessons. As the most important thing in the classroom is student engagement, a teacher who is strongly engaged in their lesson has the greatest chance to achieve the best learning outcomes for the students. Student teachers are expected to give the theoretical grounds for their decisions, but also take risks and defy the fear of failure. Trying out new ways, creating something they did not copy from school books is strongly encouraged and highly valued in student teaching even if it meant a momentary exit from one's own comfort zone. That is why the most important thing for the student teacher to learn is reflection. A teacher's professional development depends on their skill to reflect on their own work and identify how they can continually improve. In Finland, we have moved away from centralized government assessment of teaching and school quality. When I went to school half a century ago, we would still have school inspectors who would come and assess the level of teaching. Even the youngest student realized the abnormal nature of those days. Nothing was the same as usual. The teachers were nervous. They made us do things we would never usually do. And the atmosphere was unpleasantly tense. Now in Finland, the task of assessing the quality of teaching in schools has been given to schools and teachers themselves in the form of self-assessment. Had we continued to have strict external control, had someone else told me how to teach or how to assess my students, denying me the chance of using my own skills and holistic understanding of the profession and its goals, I would have quit teaching a long time ago. In conclusion, I fell in love with teaching the day I realized it was a creative job. Over the years, my love for teaching has only strengthened and deepened and I believe it is mostly because of the autonomy I enjoy. The strength of the Finnish education system, therefore, lies in high quality teacher education, the autonomy of teachers, and the trust placed in educators to create the best education system for all, based on the rigorous scientific research. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Jana. We have a few questions already coming into the Q&A box. Um, you mentioned in your speech the importance of student teachers finding their teacherhood or style of teaching. Could you perhaps briefly explain how you help te uh, student teachers to find their teacherhood during their training? Uh, well, first of all, we make it clear that both the mentoring teacher and the student teacher and any teacher exist because of and for the student or pupil and the pupil only. And, and secondly, the student teacher is also a student learning the ropes of teaching. We are not trying to make them complete the, the learning complete during the student teaching year because learning 
continues. But they are also, they treated as younger colleagues to us. Uh, they plan lessons extremely well, brainstorm, take risks, make mistakes, are not being assessed or graded. Uh, they analyze, reflect, contemplate, discuss, collaborate with peers, teachers, students, staff, set goals for themselves and use self and peer evaluation. While the mentoring teacher walks by the student teacher, encourages them, guides, listens, gives advice if asked, but does not provide answers, um, expects work from the student teacher, but does not expect perfect lessons, expects the student teacher to be fully committed to student teaching and rejoices when the student teacher succeeds, uh, guides the student teacher to seek and find, appreciates the work that the student teacher does and keeps learning from the student teacher. So um, student teachers have a good theoretical knowledge of learning and teaching in general. In student teaching, their task is to try, try different ways of creating an effective way of making the student learn. And there is no shortcut for this. It is the contents to be learned and the group of students that are in the focus. And this can be done only if the student teacher is encouraged to use their own brain and creativity. And to be creative, one needs trust and a safe, supportive environment. They also need to feel safe to make mistakes and learn from them. And they need experiences of success and joy in the classroom. Through long discussions, reflection and praise, we as mentoring teachers make them understand that they can they can be the best teachers as long as they are willing to work for that and that it will take time. So we don't want them to become our clones uh, because a good teacher is one of their kind. So we're all different and there is no one way of delivering the best lesson. Thank you. That, that brings us on really nicely to the next question that was submitted. And it says, in Finland, it seems we talk about the responsibility of teachers to develop themselves rather than teachers being held accountable by a, a government inspection body to become better. And so the question is, how does the Finnish education system make sure that teachers do continue to develop high quality education and teaching practices? Um, yes, I, I mentioned that we believe in self-assessment, self-evaluation, but in general, I would say that the threshold of all the pupils and parents and society to contact uh, schools or any authorities is very low. And I think um, that's from one part ensures that it is done, but we don't have any um, compulsory um, courses that uh, teachers need to do to kind of renew their qualifications. Uh, it, it's a culture of trust, I would say. But of course, then um, a lot of uh, education is being offered all the time. And I would say that in Finland, our, um, if you think about in-service education, I think uh, teachers are really keen on gaining more and more education. I, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, of course, no, it makes sense. <laughs> Sorry. No, of course. And the next question is, um, Jana, in your speech, you mentioned about special education. And the question is, how are children with disabilities, including learning disabilities, included in schools in, in Finland? Are, there, uh, are they included in mainstream schools or are there separate schools for children with significant disabilities? How does it work? Now, at the main, mainstream schools, we have um, uh, special education teachers work together with uh, subject teachers. And uh, there was a law passed maybe six years ago, uh, which, um, uh, make sure that every subject teacher uh, takes, um, I mean, make sure that uh, if there are any students that are leaving behind, they will uh, collaborate with other professionals and that the, the student will get uh, some aid. But it's done, all the students are integrated in schools. That's the policy. There might be still some um, uh, different policies in some uh, areas in Finland, but, but the, main, 
the main idea is that um, all of them are integrated and and we believe in um, in uh, multidisciplinary professionals working together and and this special education teacher coming into the classroom with everybody else but then there are different needs of course and sometimes um, they work separately but but as I said about a third of all the students uh, use these um, uh, use special education at some point of the school years so they are there are different types of problems they might have and then they will pass after they received some help. That's great, thank you. And at this point, I'd like to bring Minna back in, but Jana, keep your camera on. Um, we had a question uh, which Minna was answering about, how do we ensure that the latest kind of research findings are passed on to teachers to kind of inform the latest practice? So Minna, it would be great if you could answer that. And then Jana, if you have anything to add about that, please feel free. Yeah, thank you. Sorry for cutting out from the call. What I was trying to say was that uh, since Finnish teachers have academic education and this education also gives them the curiosity to follow the research in their field, so they are very eager to do that. And we are also offering a lot of these continued education courses. They can be very short ones. It could be just a few hours uh, via video call or something like that, but they are also there are also extensive courses available to, to all the time update the knowledge. So the teachers have have the, the latest research also at their hands. Yes, and many, many teachers or student teachers have the opportunity of um, uh, carrying out the research for the master's thesis um, on their own work, which I think is a wonderful way of uh, keeping them interested in um, carrying out research later as well. Thank you. And then the final question for today, we've talked a lot about the, the strengths of the Finnish education system, but what do you think are some of the, the weaknesses or areas we need to improve in the Finnish education system? And what do you think we can learn from international collaboration? Who would like to go first? Minna? Well, uh, I must say that Finnish teachers and Finnish teacher educators are very, very critical. So you will get a long list of things to improve still. And, and one of them is this polarization. So we know that all schools in Finland are good schools. But when you go to the level of individual pupils and students, you see huge differences between, you know, the home background and, and these types of things. And we are still struggling to find the very best ways of, of tackling those problems. So we have done that work for a very long time, but the, also the problem seems to be evolving. So these differences are becoming different when, when time goes by. So, so we still have to, to work on those. Then also we are um, having a lot of, um, kind of negative messages from from the secondary schools of, of pupils uh, feeling uh, frustrated and, and exhausted by the school. So it seems that there is something also there that we have to work on. And of course, as our rector Sari mentioned, also the same problems in university students. So that's also something that we have to really work on in the future. Um, and I think that after this home-based learning period, I think it's taught us much more beyond things like of, of digital uh, teaching and learning. But I think uh, many things that we will think anew after we get back to school buildings. I think so. Definitely. And something I still want to add is this international connection. So if you only work with educators from your own country, you are very much tied to the tradition of that country. So that's also uh, something that holds true for all science in general, that we really have to open the doors and windows to, to everybody and, and all the researchers in the world to be able to think a little bit outside the box of the, the national system, but also uh, to utilize all the research that is available in the world in this field. Yes, we have a lot to learn from others as well. Yeah. Thank you. And that's a, a wonderful point, I think, to, to close this event. So thank you to all of our speakers for uh, your participation. Let me just briefly share my screen. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the event, this event is designed 
It's been a first of hopefully many discussions we'll be organising with the UK about the future of education and our other global themes. We had so many questions submitted during the event and we weren't able to answer all of them, so we will do our best to answer them after the event and when we send around the recording. Um, that being said, if you have any other questions or you'd like to discuss with us the possibility of collaboration, uh, please do get in touch. My email is on the screen for you there. Uh, finally, as I said, we'll be emailing you a recording of this event with subtitles as soon as possible, but hopefully by Monday. So thank you so much for your time and taking part in this webinar. It was wonderful to hear your views and we look forward to continuing our discussions with the UK. So thank you and have a good day.